Um, so without further ado, let me introduce uh, Nate. Uh, I'm, first of all, I should introduce myself. I'm Matthew Battles. Uh, I'm Associate Director of uh, Metalab at Harvard, which is a, a project uh, headquartered at the Berkman Klein Center. Uh, and my uh, familiarity with Nate and his work dates from the time that I started at Metalab, um, because both of us were involved early on with uh, uh, activity around the Digital Public Library of America. Uh, Nate, in his uh, role as a kind of instigator, impresario, design thinker about libraries and the communities they activate, uh, was a very early um, supporter of uh, activities around the Digital Public Library of America, uh, hosting hackathons and uh, encouraging the institutions he was uh, a part of to, uh, to um, participate and contribute to uh, the birth of that um, new institutional form. Uh, but Nate's uh, engagement with the library world goes well beyond that. Um, uh, he's been a, a, a librarian uh, and a leader at a number of um, major metropolitan libraries uh, around the country, the Brooklyn Public Library, uh, the Chattanooga Public Library, where he headed a remarkable program um, uh, called The Fourth Floor, which was um, an uh, emptied out old uh, book storage space. Uh, it was big enough to like land an airplane in. I mean, it was an amazing space. And Nate and his colleagues animated it with all kinds of activity, design and making and uh, and community is really a remarkable place. Um, uh, Nate also uh, uh, brought a familiarity with uh, Silicon Valley uh, to his work at, at the San Jose Public Libraries, uh, and now uh, is animating um, uh, the library community in the uh, metropolitan New York area through his work at the Metropolitan Library Council of New York, uh, which is going to be uh, the focus of his talk today. Uh, what Nate is doing there, Nate and his colleagues, is very exciting. Um, Nate's own background uh, incorporates art and design in a way that makes the connection to Metalab very um, kind of salient and rich uh, for all of us. And I think you'll see that in the programming and the activities that he's, uh, that he's uh, instigating, um, at Metro 599, there is the spirit of play and possibility um, that, that animates um, the arts, design, and, and technology. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my friend, Nate Hill. Thanks. That is so kind of you. Thank you so much. Um, hey, I am uh, really excited to be here and get to talk with all of you today. Uh, before I get into anything about the presentation and about the, the work that I'm up to, I think that given uh, yesterday uh, hearing once again a horrible budget proposal uh, that slashes IMLS, NEH, and NEA, I'm just going to say, and, and a lot of other things, that um, everybody in this room obviously cares about that a lot and um, if you like any of the stuff that I'm going to talk about in the next 20 25 minutes um, you should be speaking out about that nastiness so um, again thanks I'm really psyched to be here um, what I want to do is explain to you this uh, sort of crazy organization that I'm wrangling and the various uh, projects and programs that are going on there uh, and sort of explain just my my, my thoughts around all of it, and really, uh, I'm seeking input from everybody else in this uh, room. So, the Metropolitan New York Library Council. I'm going to give you a little bit of background, because these places are hard to explain. In New York State, we have a whole lot of library infrastructure. We have public library systems, which will help a region of public libraries all work together, collaborate in some way. Uh, school library systems, which do the same thing regionally for the, the schools. And then these things called the Reference and Research Library Councils. We are one of those. Uh, they are divided up like this. And so what the heck is that, right? Um, 1966, these things were formed. And the point was to help different kinds of knowledge organizations share resources um, and work together, collaborate in all of these different ways. So in 1966, you can imagine that that was largely about interlibrary loan and book delivery services and things like that. Uh, pretty traditional, like library consortia types of activities. Um, you can see we have, as you look to the state, we have this 
kind of tiny but really dense region that we serve. Um, I have 250 plus or minus a few uh, libraries, archives, and museums that are members of our network, as well as individuals who can join as well. We are funded through the state library for the most part. It's sort of a combination of money that's coming from the state library, uh, grants that we, uh, we seek, as well, and membership dues. So we're an interesting sort of agile nonprofit organization working in the library space. It really differentiates us uh, from others in, in a kind of fun way. We also all work together. Um, as a group, all of these councils make something called the Empire State Library Network. So you're gonna start to feel, as I go through this, sort of like an EAM style, like powers of 10 thing, where you can see these like giant structures that go all the way down to like the microscopic. Um, and that's definitely like a recurrent theme with this kind of infrastructure. Does that all make sense, just in terms of what this is as of thus far? And so this is us, yes. Yes, in, uh, it's state education law 1966. And you can go, if you like want to dig deep into that, you can go to the state library page and there's all the, uh, all the stuff that you could ever want. But this is us, the Metropolitan New York Library Council. And I like to use this as like my first metaphor for what we're all about. Have, have any of you seen the Herman Grid illusion before? All right, so if you stare at this for long enough, you end up seeing those like dark little spots that show up between things. And we are very much the, the institution that's doing the work between the other things. The sort of sweet spot for us is whenever we're able to knit together the projects and the ideas and the values of the member organizations. So while we occasionally have programs that engage like a single institution or a group of single institutions, we really try to fit into these spaces. So, when I arrived at Metro two and a half years ago or something like that, it was an organization that was already in transition, but I knew that I had an opportunity to kind of grow it into a new direction. And so I want to go through sort of like my change management model as a chronology that will help you kind of understand what's going on there. So I've split this up into three sections, sort of the, the platform, adjusting like all of, the, all of the, the basics of this place, right? Our own policies, our own bylaws, our own infrastructure, our, our sort of uh, space. And then from there, I can go into the programs and the way that we start to talk about ourselves and, and the, the presentation. So I arrived at Metro two and a half years ago. We had been in this space for like 25 years or something like that, down near Union Square. And while the location was killer in a lot of ways, it was also, um, you know, the rent was about to skyrocket. We had three years left on the lease. And in the first few weeks that I was there, I was getting calls from real estate agents saying, hey, uh, we heard that you're going to need to move. So would you like to talk to us? And we're like, I just took this job. Um, but it turned out to be like an incredible uh, blessing because we were able to negotiate a buyout with the landlord, uh, start looking at other spaces, and really think from scratch, what does it mean to design a space in, in the middle of New York City that is a place that brings together all of these different kinds of organizations and helps level up their staff in all these different ways. And so this is some of the early uh, you know, construction uh, pictures of when we moved over to 11th Avenue at 45th Street, uh, north of the Hudson Yards project, right in Hell's Kitchen, in a kind of amazing, gritty New York neighborhood there. Um, we have about 6,000 square feet of space where we began to build out this, uh, this studio. This is the floor plan that we came up with. I was lucky I got to work with uh, Marble Fairbanks architects who are absolutely wonderful, have done uh, the Schomburg Center with NYPL. The, uh, they're working on the Greenpoint Branch Library in Brooklyn and the Glen Oaks Branch out in Queens. So some really experienced architects that I could work with to figure out what's the ideal layout for something like this. And so we split it up in this way, literally in thirds of a stage, a studio, and staff, but then this kitchen, which is actually a really important kind of heart of the place as well. 
And this is what it's kind of come together as, right? This is, uh, this is our, our motto. This is what we're trying to do in the space. And you, see, you can see that it's like, it's got a pretty good open vibe to it, right? It's a place that you feel like you can come in, you can make a little bit of a mess, you can experiment with a thing or two, and you'll see as the programs unfold what that looks like. So that's the platform, really. Um, I won't speak about like all of our boring policy stuff that we've had to adjust. That's stuff that you just have to do. Any questions about like the space and, and, and all of that before I move it on? Cool, all right. So the programs are incredibly diverse. Uh, one of the things we did to kind of kickstart the, uh, the change and the transition was launch our own fellowship program. Uh, we used this process that I'd learned in Tennessee called the reverse pitch where instead of having a hackathon where you have people come in and they all make a bunch of useless things that nobody needs, you actually seed the, 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 uh, the thing with a bunch of ideas. You reach out and you find the problems of practice all across the, the network of organizations. So very much like the way one of the night news challenges would work, um, we created a platform and we reached out to everyone and we said, do you think that you have some kind of problem of practice that is similar um, uh, to, uh, and, and useful across other kinds of organizations? And if so, publish it here so that the fellows have something that they can respond to. Uh, we launched a fantastic fellowship, had three people uh, do, do amazing projects, and you'll hear about some of them as I go. But it was the beginning of us sort of signaling this transition toward um, really taking this, like, this, this laser focus on the space between different organizations. Um, I have a program manager that, uh, named Davis Aaron Anderson, whose title is Program Manager for Libraries, Technology, and Culture, which is a lot of stuff, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, she is, she, she's sort of grabbed on to one big chunk of our work and is wrangling it. We had a grant that we were working on with the Institute, uh, with IMLS. Uh, to do web literacy training for librarians all across New York City. Um, in addition to sort of creating cohorts of folks and like working with them in our own space, we started producing educational events that we would then send out to the different locations. So this is in the Dweck Auditorium at the Brooklyn Public Library. Doing, I, I don't know if any of you have seen any of their curriculum, but it's really fun, engaging ways for, um, for library workers to think about how the web works. Uh, Davis is also now leading a really important and large initiative. Uh, we received funding from uh, the city of New York to uh, start uh, digital safety, privacy, and security training with the goal that one person from every library location in New York City is going to be trained in this space. Uh, it's a big set of partnerships. We're working with um, some folks from Tandem, which was formerly uh, research action design to design some of the curriculum. We're pulling things from the Data Privacy Project, the Library Freedom Project, and a lot of the other resources that are out there uh, to create this. And we'll deliver it in a bunch of different ways. There will be online modules, because you can imagine it's very difficult for busy library workers to come to these things sometimes. So there will be uh, modules that they can participate in online, and then a series of different events so that we can help uh, level people up in different ways from there. So we're in the middle of that, and that's really going to kick off this summer, and very exciting and something that I want to make sure that I communicate to all of you in case you end up in New York. There will be a final convening for this project in October of 2018. Um, we're really looking at um, involving uh, artists and having a big exhibit component to this, uh, as well as presentations. So kind of keep an eye out for that, because in October there will be a, a big blowout privacy fest of some sort. Um, we've also worked on, and this is sort of a, a model that we've used for a bunch of different things. We've worked with the, the Meta Lab and with the folks from the uh, Open uh, Curriculum Explorer uh, to host these sort of ideation type events. Um, the idea thons are a moment where somebody's got a product that they're working on understanding. And so you build kind of a charrette around it and you bring our network in to help inform what that pro product can be, right? And so we've done this with a few different things, um, but 
you know, one of the beautiful things about having the network that we do is if somebody's thinking about building some kind of reader's advisory tool, we can pull in representatives from Brooklyn Public, from Queens Library, from New York Public, and have them be part of the conversation so that people aren't designing products without any kind of feedback loop. Um, and so we've served as a center for this. We also had folks from the Roper Center for Public Opinion Polling Data at Cornell uh, come in as they're thinking about how, how could they bring that as a resource to public libraries and others. So um, we, we're definitely sort of an ideation space for a lot of different projects. Um, our studio is, uh, when you saw that floor plan, really at the, at the center of this whole place. I'm not gonna speak about every single module within the studio, but basically what we're trying to do with our studio is have something like a makerspace, but for digital libraries. What are the tools that you need access to so that you can come and participate, read and write to the web in meaningful ways? And so there's a variety of different things in here. One thing that has really taken off because one of our fellows uh, dove into podcasting head first is our, uh, is our audio facility, which you know people can come and they can book time in. You can attend classes of all different sorts uh, and, uh, and take part in that. Um, the, her podcast, which you should all subscribe to, the Library Bytegeist, which is all stories of people doing really amazing things in libraries and archives around New York City. Uh, her podcast is great, but it also led her to something that we're like just now announcing. Uh, she received support from the Mellon Foundation to do, um, to do work around preserving podcasts, because it's kind of crazy. There's all of this content out there that's being made, and there's really no great preservation strategy for podcasters. Um, so that is like just now beginning to launch and it's exciting and it's very meta because it'll be a podcast about preserving podcasts, right? It's really fun. Um, Molly also wrangles uh, our partnership with the Transfer Collective who are an amazing group of sort of archivist activists around New York City who have been, and beyond New York City, who have made a priority of identifying um, obsolete media formats, particularly of communities that are just not going to find a good way to preserve their story one way or another. And then they offer um, a, a, an opportunity for people to learn how to deal with this. And so they have been setting up previously all over New York in like artist lofts, these different uh, media migration racks. We knew that this was the kind of work that we wanted to do in 599, but we didn't know how we could possibly staff it. So going and creating an MOU with a collective, a loose collective like this, and saying, you know, help us set up this rack, help us create the documentation around this, um, help us identify people who need access to these tools, it's been really successful. And so what's interesting and sort of happening on the fly is we're finding, um, we're finding that some of the modules in the studio become little like business models and like little revenue generators that help support themselves. And then something like this becomes more like a co-op in which uh, everybody's contributing. And, and so we're still sort of prototyping all of these things and it's fascinating to watch. Um, we also have a whole software development team. When I say that, it's a few people. It's not like a massive software development team. There are 15 of us, by the way, I, I, I should add. Um, and uh, a few years ago, we, we started as the service hub for uh, New York State for the DPLA, which um, looks a little different in every state, obviously, but um, it's kind of interesting the way that it has worked uh, in New York because we have that macro level, uh, all of the different councils. And um, what we do is we reach out via all of them to find collecting institutions across the state and we're the service hub, right? We just aggregate the metadata, clean it up, and then uh, shoot it upstream to DPLA. What's a, become a big priority for me is starting to launch um, a better consortial repository service. You would think that the cultural organizations around New York, as rich and robust as they are, would all have something in place, but they totally don't. Um, and so we're working on building out a product right now that I think will be really helpful. We've always had sort of a, a consortial repository service called the Digital Culture of Metropolitan New York. Um, 
we've got something much more exciting in the works. Um, we have exhibit space. Uh, this is an image of a woman named Leah Meisterlin, who's actually on our board, who um, created these images along with a historian using the digitized fire insurance um, atlases from NYPL to create these amazing, rich visualizations of um, what New how New York was organizing before zoning laws. I can't speak to it in great detail, but like there, it's something that you can really get lost in. And so we're trying to get a, a steady rotation of these kinds of exhibits. Because what happens is like, then you come into the studio and you're doing one thing and you run into someone else doing something else and then you explore the thing on the wall and a kind of magical thing starts to happen that way. So we're trying to really animate things to, to a certain extent. Um, this is our classroom space. Uh, it's heavily used. Um, it's heavily used both by us and by our membership, but we also, we also generate revenue by renting these spaces out to others. And I, I try very hard to keep that sort of within our mission so that we have a lot of like-minded folks. But you really, you can also be anybody and rent these spaces, right? Because we need money. Um, but it's a great spot, and it's funny, I don't have my like, program notes up, but I had three different events that are coming up in the next month that I wanted to read you all the, the titles to. But if you go to metro.org slash events, you'll get a sense of the kind of things that are going on. I mean, we've got, we've got a big, we're doing a bunch with New York City's Open Data Week. Um, there's just, there's a bunch of cool stuff going on. And then there's this like, notion that we could be um, a deployment network for all different kinds of interesting projects that are going on in library land. So there are a lot of these kind of like labs that pop up. The Library Innovation Lab is a fantastic thing that's going on here. And this is a project that came out of the Library Innovation Lab. So the idea that we have all this network of real life situations in which you can deploy these projects, these tools, these things that you've been working on is something that I really want to focus on and create a pattern for. Um, so I've been, I've been having a lot of fun talking to Matt Phillips um, about this. We just purchased one of these spaces and we'll be working on setting it up in the next couple of months. And it becomes something that people can come, and it's almost like we're a, we're a showroom for these different kinds of projects, so that people can figure out, would this work back in my library, back in my archive? I don't know. And then, this is really important, this is why I put smoked fish in the name of the uh, presentation, which you probably saw and were like, what? Um, the kitchen is a really important center for us. Uh, these are images of our staff. Um, but one of the things we do is try to open it up to people if they want to come and like make macaroni and cheese and use that as kind of a, a binding agent, that's kind of a gross way to put it, uh, as something to bring together a, a crowd, that's totally okay. I mean, we know that, like, that, um, that food brings community together. And so we really invested in having like a big, spacious kitchen that feels open and inviting in that way. And we did have smoked fish. Kyle, our general manager, who is amazing, brought in a fish smoker and did that in the space. It's like, unbelievable. And so, all right, getting into presentation. And this is where it's going to start to get a little fuzzy because I'm going to start talking about the stuff that I don't fully understand, but I'm trying to explore as I, I figure out how to move the complexity of all of this forward, right? Because you can imagine that having like the MoMA Library and Columbia University Libraries and NYPL as members and then having like the Joseph Paluski Institute in Greenpoint with like two people working at it, uh, like the, it's very hard to figure out how to pull these different kinds of types of organizations together. So I've been using this Herman grid as the metaphor, but it turns out that it's like, it's, a, it's too simple. Um, and I've been trying to learn more from uh, ecosystems and ecology thinking and systems thinking in general. So bear with me as I point to some of the things that I'm exploring and I would really love to get input from people on these thoughts because they're young thoughts at this point. Um, there's this notion of patrodynamics, shifting mosaics, and disturbance regimes, which sounds kind of fancy and exciting. And I'll try to explain what some of that is with the coming slides. So when you get to this idea of mosaics, the way that, um, that in ecology people have been thinking about ecosystems is that you have 
a mosaic of the different kinds of sort of static ecosystems, right? You have your pond, you have your riparian system, you have your meadows and such, and then there are these edges in which they interact. And that's totally analogous to what goes on at Metro, right? We have academic libraries and they organize. There's ACRL New York. We have art libraries and they organize because there's Arlis New York. And you can go on with the, the archivists have the Society of Archivists in New York. There are all of these different sort of sub-communities. And what's interesting is figuring out where the overlap is because we don't just serve institutions. It turns out that we're serving individuals as well. And it's the people that work at those institutions that work like the edges and create this sort of dynamic shift so that when something happens in the environment, then all of a sudden the activities kind of move around, right? And the map changes, the mosaic changes. And so what I'm trying to do is figure out how to map this sort of ecological theory to the organizational theory of what's going on uh, at Metro. And so this notion of a disturbance regime is kind of like, we're in that, right? <laughs> there's no doubt about it. In ecology, this is when you're saying, oh, there's a wildfire, right? It plows through and it changes the environment and then the different things regenerate in different ways at the edges, right? And for us, I mean, I think it's fair, fair to say that we're in the midst of a pretty great shift. There's a lot of stuff going on. So for me as a leader to figure out how I can possibly plan for it, how I can anticipate the ways that people are gonna move, because it becomes about the people. It becomes about the individuals at these places and the way that they start to drift, and it's usually value-based, because you find that there are a lot of cross-cutting values across academic libraries, public libraries, archives, and such, and there's this shift. And so what I'm hoping to do is find ways to understand and anticipate that shift better. And this is sort of a close-up of like the, the, way that, um, the way that I've been thinking about this. So again, young thoughts, intense organization with a whole lot of stuff going on. I really welcome any input people have about this, um, about this sort of complex environment and figuring out how to, how to plan for it and anticipate change. I think that that's the thank you slide. So, thank you. I would love to get tons of questions from everybody here and feedback and input, um, open to anything. Yeah. Oh, we got to get the mic all the way to you. In your, maybe just like a very simple question. My name is Boaz. I'm an affiliate here at Berkman. Are you um, like mapping individual names of people at these organizations and like trying to model how people might, like can you go more into how you're thinking about navigating a disturbance regime, regime and like what it means to, to follow or map out these systems so I, I, practically? I, I mean, how far can I go into it? Not terribly far at this point. I mean, certainly we collect the typical data from like our programs and things like that, right? And we watch the, the popularity of different meetups and we do our best to have sort of a an understanding of, of who's coming from where to those things. But again, we haven't really particularly formalized it at this point. And I should point out that like one, one of the key things about this place is that a lot of things hadn't been formalized yet, right? And so um, even just having sort of a CRM style approach to, to thinking about all of this, it just wasn't in place yet. So I guess I would say, yeah, we're working on that. <laughs> I, mean, I could see, I work on, on web standards and web browsers. I could see sort of how this way of modeling systems and groups could map onto like these bigger uh, agendas we have for how we want to move the web platform forward even when um, like architects of standards and engineers move between different browser engine companies, for example. So I'm super excited to hear you say that and would love to talk to you more about that because there is a hope and it's not just like the abstract nature of the slides, but there is a hope that, that, that this is abstracted in the sense that this way of thinking could be applied to different kinds of groups other than, uh, than just the one I was speaking of. So we should, we should talk more about that. 
or right now if you want. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, we, we can connect. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hey. Um, I was wondering <clears throat> if you could talk about your efforts and or advice you might have for how you're dealing with a library that's, let's say, out on Long Island versus in, you know, Manhattan. Mm. A library that is academic um, versus, you know, public library, et cetera. A, li a library um, in the medical space, yeah. at medical, like um, a medical school, and also a library that's part of a consortium in the sense that and really I have one specific one in mind at Hofstra Medical School, which is part of a whole consortium unto itself. So Hofstra Medical School, new medical school created to link up with Northwell Health, with, which is, for those of you in this area, is a uh, medical consortium that includes hospitals and groups, whatever, in, in Long Island, Manhattan, Northern uh, in the Bronx and Westchester, et cetera. So, and the core of their library is digital. Yeah. In other words, all their journals are online. People access them through the internet. A large part of what the library does is deal with intellectual property, light, property rights issues with monopolistic suppliers, sure. um, et cetera, et cetera. No, I'm glad you asked that question. So, um, so, Excuse me. We, and this is indicative again of, of the, the complexity. We have an entire program that I didn't even mention, uh, our hospital library services program, uh, which we receive significant funding uh, from New York State for. And it's based on the number of hospital beds within our service region. There's a, a complicated formula that's used to determine uh, how much money it is. And then we have a hospital library services coordinator who is only part-time right now. I'd love to see this grow because it's a really, uh, it's a really interesting space. Um, we uh, offer collection development grants to the hospitals. We offer technology grants as well. And it's a, it's a shifting landscape because, um, because of all of the hospital mergers. And because uh, you know, every time that uh, the hospital library services group kind of gets together, there's a, a lot of concern that their, their libraries are not uh, sort of seen a, a, in the same way that they used to be. They're not, they don't feel valued at times in the way they used to be. And so we're working on figuring out um, how, to, uh, how to do more with that program, quite frankly. The, um, all of the other councils do this as well. Um, and so in, in April, all of those hospital library services coordinators are coming together for one of these sort of like brainstorms around these issues. I won't be able to speak in great detail to the specifics of it. Unfortunately, that's kind of the nature of my job is that like there are so many different programs. <laughs> Once it goes too deep, I have to go to the program manager. But um, I, I'm glad you brought it up because it's actually a really important service that comes through the council that, uh, again, it's, it's, it's hard to speak to all of them. I yeah. Have a quick caveat. Yeah. How about the entrepreneurial side? You can talk about that in general or specifically men. What I mean by that is there's New York. You need to use the microphone. There's people out there in audio. Oh, audio. sorry. Sorry. Yeah. In New York State, New York City is pushing entrepreneurialism, including medical entrepreneurialism. So how are you dealing with helping people create businesses or, you know, stuff like that? So this gets into that interesting space where, you know, we don't serve the direct public, right? We serve all of these organizations. And, and where I totally believe in libraries as, as engines of economic development and, uh, and, and sort of democratic access to what you need in order to, uh, to be an entrepreneur, what we have to do is be one step removed and think, okay, what are the things that we need to provide for each of, of these organizations or this cluster of organizations? And then interestingly, there's also the element of maybe they, they think they've already got it figured out, right? And that's always an interesting thing to navigate is, you know, when do, when do people want your help? 
versus uh, when do they want your support. It's that when to, when to lead, when to partner. Um, so it, it's sort of an ongoing puzzle. Um, I would say that the most direct thing um, that we do thinking in terms of entrepreneurism is I, I'd like to inspire that kind of spirit in more knowledge workers. Um, you know, one of the things that I really want to have happen when people come and do anything at Metro is I want them to come and feel like they gained something while they were there that means they can go back and alter and change the environment that they work in, uh, in one way or another. And that's a, that's a very sort of entrepreneurial approach and creative approach to librarianism that I think is key. Yeah. Okay, I'm Mary Minow. Thanks for Hi. coming. For those who don't know, um, Nate's one of the, if you haven't figured it out, one of the most creative people in our profession. And one of my favorite um, is Scan Jose, where you can, can take <laughs> take your, an app and walk around the city of San Jose, and and with through virtual reality, it will pull up pictures from the picture file and in, in the library of what the building that you're looking at used to look like, which is super cool. Despite my being in these interstices uh, places in my work in libraries, I've never thought about it in terms of an ecological system, and I think that's fascinating. And what it sparked in me just now is another analogy, is a biological system of the connective tissue that holds all our muscles in place, mm. the myofascial tissue, and what happens when that's cut, and that would be another thing to explore. Definitely. Uh, and, you know, I was just talking to Matthew this morning a little bit about... Uh, the power of metaphor, right, and and how how useful it can be to 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 find these different ways of of sort of playfully or or really and and really thoughtfully uh, comparing your your work across different fields, across different sort of ways of thinking. Um, so I I welcome uh, metaphor and simile in in any uh, in any situation. It's useful. Yeah. Thanks, and thanks, that's nice to say. It's always, it's funny when someone references like a, a much older project because you end up being like, and that was kind of bad. But, <laughs> but, but it wasn't, it was fine. It was just like a different time, right? <laughs> so it's funny. Hi, yeah. thank you for your talk. I'm Ahmad, a fellow at Berkman Client Center. I very much like that you use this uh, ecology metaphor. I tried to sell it two times last year to NSF. They said that it's old, outdated, but I am less liked it anyway. Uh, I, I think one of the interesting things when you use this ecology metaphor is that, <clears throat> especially if you think about innovation, there are bigger entities in ecology that they are not very agile, but they have a lot of capabilities. But you have smaller players which are agile, but do not have those capabilities. And it's great if those bigger players can pass some of their capabilities to smaller uh, players to innovate. To, an example is that you have massive academic libraries in New York. Uh, with a lot of infrastructure, and you have smaller players, they do not have that infrastructure. If some of these capabilities can move between them, they can create a lot of, and I think your position is fantastic in this regard. My question is, are you doing some of this facilitation of moving in these capabilities between these institutions? Definitely, uh, and the fellowship was, was really uh, aimed at that uh, quite a bit. Um, but that's, it, it's cool. That's what actually ends up happening at the individual level, right? So you'll have some of these big organizations with a great deal of capacity, great deal of talent and resources. And you end up with people who work at them, who are experts in one thing or another, who then feel obliged as part of the network to come and teach. And so the, I should have mentioned that one of the key things about the way our, our, our events and, and classes and such work is that anybody can pitch an event. You fill out a form, you pitch an event, we pay $100 an hour, and you, know, you can come and we only charge as much as we need to in order to cover the, the costs and essentially break even. So um, we end up sort of using mechanics like that in order to, to balance the network in that way, um, which is a ton of fun. And again, you know, all of these things, there's an informality to all of it, I think you're, you're, you're catching, that um, is both super important to kind of the culture, but it's also really important to figure out how to formalize more of it so that it can be uh, replicable. Thanks, that's a great question. 
Hey, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak a bit about the pros and the cons and, and the relevance of a you know region, regional membership model when, you know, as you mentioned, the world of libraries and the way that we connect across state lines or across municipal lines is very different from 60, 70 years ago. Um, I also, maybe related to that, just thinking about library budgets in general, um, I find a lot like things like the Night News Challenge and uh, there's a lot of sort of one-off patches to sort of imbue new sorts of programming in libraries. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, I find that a lot of libraries I work with, their budgets and the sort of the main buckets of, yep. you know, we spend this much money on content each year, we spend this much money on professional development, those sort of big buckets haven't changed very much. And so just going forward, I'd love to hear a bit of your thinking around how libraries spend money um, to sort of catch up to or align with the sort of mission and vision that a lot of people are now shaping for them in this century? Multiple questions in there, so as I answer, remind me of the pieces that I'm missing. Um, one of the, so I, I've just, again, because of colleagues here, have gotten sucked into uh, Open Field, the, the project out of the Walker Art Center that was a three-year-long commons uh, that had all kinds of different, um, you know, uh, community projects in this sort of open commons. And one of the criticisms of it in the, in the book um, is the notion that like, okay, it was three years long and like the, uh, that an experiment that is like a commons that has a beginning and end isn't really a commons, right? And so actually I think that's one of the exciting things about these regional consortia is that, you know, there, there is um, durability to it, right? That we, uh, that, that we last. And, I, and it, it's, it, again, this gets to an ecosystem approach because I think it's really important to have pop-up labs of different sorts that generate ideas, but the notion that there could be infrastructure for, for consistency and, and, and durability uh, is, really, is really important. Um, but on the, um, on the notion of being regional, and uh, whether or not that is a, a model that, that can and should persist. It's, it's important to remember that as I talk about all these fun new projects and things that are going on, one of the key things that we do is operate a delivery courier service that we, you know, we just redid the RFP, we have a new vendor, our members, absolutely depend on being able to like plug that into their interlibrary loan and, and move stuff around the city. So this, you know, it, it's key. A, and you build things on, on top of those different layers. It's like an archaeology uh, experiment of some sort. So there are things that bind us together regionally in that sense. There are things that don't. And I will say that as we do the repository services work and as I've grown sort of like the software developer talent, we're doing some work with San Diego State University. Um, we are totally allowed to work outside of our region as long as we're serving our, our region. And, and definitely with the digital services, you find that there are more and more opportunities uh, for that. Does that answer? Right. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm just thinking about these, these surf closer, right? OK. Um, so in this world, right, where nobody trusts anybody, um, when they do surveys of professions, librarians are the people you trust. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, you know, if there's any way in which you can incorporate this as some, you know, huge kind of resource that we've got, because the more divided we are, it seems like the librarians could be in some way, you know, serve a valuable community. I totally agree. I think that's why the work that we're doing with the city um, around uh, you know, individual privacy and, and understanding, um, understanding you and how you relate to all of your online activity um, that, you, that you invite or don't invite uh, is incredibly important. And so if people start to think of their neighborhood branch library as a place that they can go and that there's that, that trust has been extended to an understanding of, of, of the sort of online environment. That is 
that, that, that's really important. And so we're pursuing it pretty actively. Um, and I think it's also key not to think of that just as people coming in and asking questions at the library. Uh, it seems like everybody wants to immediately apply it to like the reference interview kind of situation where like, oh, the librarian is the trusted source. That is true, but I think that the more that we can do to push programming and events and activities and exhibits in, these, in, the, in the public sphere, um, the, the better, uh, because it's another way to, um, to have a more lasting engagement in some ways in, in that sort of trust building relationship. Because when you and I just have a conversation and you ask me a question, like it's a, it's a moment, it's gone, and hopefully I got it right, right? But if we have uh, something more robust around it, I think that can be exciting. So I'm with you, I guess is what I'm saying, yeah. Um, I'm wondering, so you use metaphor, and uh, I'm wondering about simile. So uh, who do you compare your, who do you look to for inspiration? You mentioned the Open Fields Project, just to sort of, so I can better understand where you're at headed. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, it's a, and a different answer kind of every day, uh, too. One of the things that is uh, difficult about um, running uh, Metro is that there are not a lot of other organizations in our country that are tasked with the same set of, of things that we are. So, I mean, so I'm constantly looking to... Um, to other projects, to like, and, and components of them, right? Because nothing maps perfectly. Um, I mean, you, you know, you brought Open Field to me, um, and there's a lot that sort of happens in the, uh, in, in the art space and the activist space. And um, I, I, wish that, I wish that there was like an immediate simile that came to mind, but maybe that's part of, uh, of our fabric is, is that we don't have something exactly like us. Um, it's, a, it's, it's picking and choosing the right things from the different places. Hey. Hi, Linda Rosen at the Harvard Kennedy School Library. Hey. Hi. Um, so I just I had a couple uh, questions. Um, David Beard is a friend of mine, and I don't know if you know him. He's just written an article in The Atlantic about uh, libraries as newsrooms. And mm. so I'd like to connect you two on that. He was a fellow at the Shorenstein Center recently. So talking about libraries as um, creating a space for people to report the news, play, places that are news deserts at this point, which yep. Metropolitan New York is probably not. <laughs> but the Empire State Network might be more interested as you get up toward northern New York. So that was one thing, was thinking about library as newsroom. And then the other question was just about your repository. And mm -hmm. um, if you could say a little bit more about that, if you're building that in-house or if you're using outside uh, help to put that together. So um, as far as uh, newsrooms, I would love to talk to that individual, absolutely. And that's the kind of thing where, you know, if I can find a way to bring someone like that in, to do one of our like our guest talks and like do you know, uh, we we end up drawing a great audience for these things and, and that's like one of the nice things about being a hub, being a center is like we bring someone in like that, and then all of the different types of interested parties come and, and engage in whatever way is appropriate for for them. So awesome, thank you. Uh, the repository service we are building in house. Uh, right now, the plan is we're using Island Dora, which is a, a, a nice complex stack of uh, open source projects all mushed together. And um, when I arrived, we had been working with Island Dora previously with a vendor. We kind of cut loose of that, and I decided if we're going to go uh, with this technology, then we have to go all in, as you kind of have to do uh, with open source work. So I pulled a, a really brilliant uh, developer in all the way from Chile, and um, we are, uh, we're building away. Um, I can talk to you more about it offline if you'd like, but we've just, we've been working uh, with the New York Historical Society to, uh, to build a system for them. And what's a little bit different um, with us than with like sort of a, a typical vendor, particularly when you're talking about within the metropolitan New York area, we want to hand over everything. We, 
Uh, our goal is to help build a system with you, but also to train you completely and give you access to every last bit of it. So there's like zero proprietary anything. And the, the, the goal being like strengthening an open source community. Um, and, and that feels in line with our, our sort of larger mission as well. So we, I'd, I'd love to talk to you more about it if you want. Yeah. Uh, you got a lot going. Um, when you uh, go to funding agency, what's your elevator pitch? What's, how do you sum up what you're doing? I didn't get, I didn't get the pithy yeah. point. Yeah, I mean, frankly, still working on it. One of the interesting things when it's about talking to funding agencies is I find, uh, whereas in my old roles, I would always do that myself and go with that elevator pitch. I'm really about empowering a, a platform of individuals who are program managers that work with me that are smarter than me and are specified, you know, have specific knowledge in these areas. And so they will have individual um, sort, of, sort of pitches. I mean, my like general pitch is just like, you know, we are a space that is bringing together librarians, archi archivists, museum workers, knowledge workers in general. To, and and we, we try to level them up and we try to build this field. We try to make them uh, stronger and then they can go back and make their organization stronger. Um, but the, the nature of this sort of sprawling organization requires a lot of trust in my brilliant staff. And they really are um, amazing people. You can give me money if you want. <laughs> Does, is that a good pitch? <laughs> All right. This is just kind of a curiosity question. You talked about, um, is this better? Yeah. You talked great. about archivist activists. Yeah. And I've never heard of them before. And so I was wondering are these independent volunteers, like, who are these people, and what are some examples of some of the projects they are working on? I think, so I can't, so I'm not an archivist, and I can't speak with great expertise on this, but I will say that one of the things that's, that's really interesting that is going on with just uh, accelerated culture and like the ability for everybody to like participate in everything all the time is that the, 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 the ideas and the values behind archiving things are no longer sort of confined to organizing old folders and like sepia toned photographs and such. It's like you need to archive in the moment what's going on because it's going to disappear. And this is all the endangered data week stuff. And, and this, there, there are so many um, like relevant, like immediate things for archivists to plug into that it requires kind of an activist approach, right? You have to, uh, you have to, um, to get out there and have, um, yeah, again, have an active role in the conversation. So it's a, it's a great shift. I actually think it's a really, really important and strong uh, place to be coming from for librarians and archivists because you know, the, this notion that it's just about preserving old stories, is, it's not as compelling as, um, as being, like, in the moment. So, yeah. Or maybe it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just a follow-up to that. I'm thinking of the, um, the people who went around and collected the, the posters from the um, women's marches. Yeah. You know, that, that that's a perfect example, I think, of... Um, some of the kinds of things you can do to sort of, you know, preserve that. Um, and I think that's a great role to be playing. Couldn't agree more. And again, a lot of that stuff, like, it's a sweet spot for us as an organization to support and facilitate that kind of activity because it's not necessarily always associated with a single institution. It's probably a couple of people who work at that institution, work at another institution. And so... Um, I just, yeah, I think it's, it's really important work. I'm with you. Well, I think we have time for one last question. Does anybody have a question that they haven't had a chance to get to yet? Okay, well, then thank you very much, Nate. It's been a really robust conversation. Um, yeah, thanks again. Thank you all. Thank you.